Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello and welcome friends to this uh, third and concluding lecture on Jawaharlal Nehru. In previous two lectures, we have discussed his thought on um, discovery of India and how through discovery of India, he was also trying to understand or make sense of India, its philosophy and its past. We have also discussed his views on socialism, democracy and secularism. And uh, today, in, uh, in this lecture, we will be focusing on his views on internationalism or universalism and how, uh, despite being himself a staunch nationalist, there is always a urge, there is always an uh, urge to transcend the limits of uh, nation and to think about uh, world as a whole or humanity as a whole. And this he shares with many other thinkers, most significantly Rabindranath Tagore, Arvindu Ghosh and also Gandhi. So, uh, as we have uh, discussing this point again and again, when modern Indian political thinkers was also um, uh, uh, were engaged in the nationalist politics or the condition of India, at the same time they were simultaneously engage and articulating about the issues and concerns or challenges of the world as a whole. So, Gandhian critique of modern civilization or Tagore's religion of a man or here in uh, Nehru also his views on Panchasil, non-alignment movement and um, uh, universal peace and harmony that he was trying to achieve is something which uh, shows us a kind of um, approach in Indian political thought towards understanding international politics or uh, uh, views on cosmopolitanism and internationalism. So, it is no longer as it is uh, uh, argued by Eurocentric philosophers and scholars that philosophy or universal ideals are there only in um, uh, western thought and uh, in uh, India or in Asia or in Africa, there is a uh, culture or tradition and not really thought and philosophy. So, these thinkers were actually embedded in the nationalist politics at the same time reflecting upon or arguing about the challenges of the modern world and they try to resolve it and provide solution uh, to such challenges. And Nehru was one such great statesman who uh, also uh, deeply engaged uh, in the foreign, uh, foreign affairs or the uh, uh, challenges of the uh, modern world. And the idealism in Nehru, which we have uh, discussed that he was a political um, uh, leader or a pragmatic uh, leader and therefore, did not um, uh, consistently followed or blindly followed any creed or any ism that may have inspired him, may have influ influenced his thought. So, he developed his own thought and constantly reason out his positions or his decisions on any political, social and economic matters, even religion and secularism is something he constantly subject to his constant reasoning or working of the mind. At the same time, he was also an intellectual, an ideal, uh, idealist who want to uh, transform the social and economic relations in a particular fashion and in international um, uh, relations or in his views uh, about internationalism, we find his uh, idealism more expressed and uh, holistically argued uh, in, his, um, uh, in his articulation of international challenges and how in, uh, global affairs should be governed and what should be the rule of India or any particular nation 
in the formation of such global polity. So, that we are going to discuss today and in the later part of today's lecture, we will uh, briefly uh, assess uh, the political thought of Nehru and how far it is relevant even for our contemporary, uh, contemporary times. Nehru, a great nationalist, was also like Aurobindo or Rabindranath Tagore or Mahatma Gandhi, a great internationalist or humanist. So, this balance between a nationalist and internationalist and humanist is something which uh, Nehru emphasized upon, dealt with in his politics or in his relationship or in his understanding of foreign relation. And uh, he shared this concern about combining the nationalism with internationalism with many of modern Indian thinkers such as Aurobindo Ghosh, Rabindranath Tagore or Mahatma Gandhi. So, for Nehru, India's struggle for independence was part of a much greater or worldwide movement against imperialism. So, he did not see Indian freedom struggle as a kind of isolatory act or a kind of self-limiting or self-sufficient movement, uh, uh, so to say. So, for him, India's struggle for freedom struggle is part of much greater or worldwide struggle against the imperialism. And therefore, he extended, in, extended India's solidarity to the freedom struggles going on different countries in Asia and Africa. So, he, uh, so much before India's independence, many leaders of Indian National Congress, certainly Nehru, Gandhi and others also extended their solidarity to the freedom struggles that was going on in different countries of Asia and, uh, Asia and Africa. So, uh, uh, this uh, cooperation. Uh, the, the uh, unity with the other uh, countries to fight against a common enemy that is the imperialism is something which is much uh, uh, which was there uh, and very constitutive element of India's struggle for freedom. So, this anti-imperialist and he argued about his stance against the imperialism. So, even during the second world war and much before that, uh, when he went to Brussels Congress in February 1927, he expressed, articulated his thought on anti-imperialism. And again, during the Second World War, when uh, India was um, included in the uh, common fight against the fascist forces, Congress and many Indian leaders opposed it. And uh, Nehru prepared a draft, where he argued that you cannot have this hypocrisy of um, maintaining colonial rule or uh, justifying imperialism on the one hand and fighting fascism in the name of democracy or liberal uh, liberalism on the other. So, he wanted uh, uh, fight against the fascism or any authoritarian regime to be logically extended to fight against the imperialism and therefore, he justified the demand of freedom struggle in different uh, uh, different countries. So, again in his socialist ideals and dislike for any form of authoritarianism, Nehru himself was very critical of many of his uh, own personality traits and he wrote about that in a pseudonym called Chanakya and uh, uh, in uh, that he uh, argued about the possibilities of such authoritarian tendencies in any personality. So, uh, Nehru was someone who was, uh, a, uh, who was more in favor of creating a culture of democracy, of decentralization and participation of more rather than a cult or a personality cult to uh, govern India or to uh, bring about independence or uh, transform social and economic relation. So, he wanted participation and he wanted to achieve all those ideals through democratic participative manner and that becomes his article of faith and he continued to believe and practice accordingly when he was uh, 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 the prime minister of India. So, uh, in his socialist ideals and dislike for authoritarianism also had a tilt towards internationalism. So, he writes, I work for Indian independence because the nationalist in me cannot tolerate alien domination. I work for it even more because for me it is inevitable step to social and economic change. So, India's freedom struggle or India's nationalist movement is not just to fight the alien rule which he cannot tolerate, 
but more than that it is a first step for social and economic change in uh, Nehru's thought. So, I should like the Congress to become a socialist organization and join hands with other forces in the world, not in isolation or not in any independent manner of dominating or bringing about changes, but by joining the other forces that in the world who are working for a new civilization. So, his belief in socialism or social and economic transformation which can be achieved only when India attain the independence and with attainment of independence India join the forces with other countries or other uh, nations to work for a new civilization where there will be a socialist uh, pattern of um, uh, socio-economic life. So, and thus he recognized the urge in men for mutual cooperation which is the common traits of modern nation, modern community if such mutual cooperation is for the benefit of both or for the benefit of the community. So, Nehru recognized this urge in men for mutual cooperation for the progress of their self or their community. So, he regarded cooperation as the root of civilizational progress and he stated in this context that India must be prepared to discard narrow nationalism. Narrow nationalism is a kind of self limiting or restraining nationalism of a kind of isolatory nature where uh, autarky or such kind of ideas are there. So, India in uh, opinion of Nehru must be prepared to discard narrow nationalism in favor of world cooperation and real internationalism. So, even in the Trist with destiny speech as we have discussed in the previous class, the idea is not just to serve the millions of starving population in India, but is still the larger interest of humanity. So, that uh, internationalist or humanist uh, part in a nationalist uh, um, leader such as Nehru was always there, always the constitutive element of their moral, uh, uh, moral outlook or approach towards politics and rule of India in the world. So, Thus, long before independence, Nehru realized that in a fast changing world, which is fast evolving as a unit, as a single unit or globalize, uh, uh, becoming more and more interdependent uh, world, national isolation is neither, neither desirable nor possible in this world, which uh, is more interdependent. Happenings in one part of the world affects uh, the rest of the world. So, in such a world to think about isolation is something which is for Nehru neither desirable nor possible. So, he envisioned India's playing a major role in democratic collectivism will result into economic and the political internationalism which is something that leads to domination of one country over the other, one race over the other. So, he wanted India's and its um, uh, role in the um, global arena to bring about a uh, real transformation in the political and economic internationalism. So, his contribution in then a non-alignment movement and his theory of punch shield help in shaping the foreign policy in a great many newly emerging country in Asia and Africa. So, these thoughts help Nehru to make a balance between nationalism or national independence on the other hand and the role of nation in the creation of a new political and economic international order on the other. So, uh, he had a clear idea of how India should play her role in the ever changing dynamics of international politics and his later policy of non-alignment and anti-colonialism had already found a space in the speech that he gave on the 7th September 1946 as the vice president of the interim, uh, uh, interim government and uh, he spoke it thus, uh, we shall take full part in the in, in international conference as a free nation with our own policy and not as a satellite of another nation. So, dominion status or a colony represent uh, in the world as a satellite or as a shadow of a foreign nation. So, he was arguing for full participation in international conferences as a free nation with our own policy and not as a satellite of another nation we propose as far as possible to keep away from the power politics of groups 
aligned against one another which have led in the past to world wars and which may lead again to disaster on an even vaster scale. We believe that peace and freedom are indivisible and denial of freedom anywhere must endanger freedom elsewhere and lead to conflict and war. We are particularly interested in the emancipation of colonial and dependent countries and peoples and in the recognition in theory and practice of equal opportunities for all races. So, this is something which he has articulated much earlier uh, before he acted upon some of uh, his thoughts during his prime ministership where he also kept the foreign policy portfolio. So, um, uh, for him then the role of India in the for, uh, in the world affair is not for acquiring power or to join the power politics of different blocks which le already led to conflicts, wars and certainly two world wars which he has seen. Um, and uh, then imme immediately after the world war there is a kind of uh, 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 polarization of world into two power blocks. Uh, uh, led by Soviet Russia on the one hand or America on the other capitalist and the so communist bloc. Uh, Nehru wanted to avoid such blocks. For him India's role in global world is to uh, strengthen peace and freedom and for him denial of freedom uh, anywhere must and will certainly lead to endanger of freedom elsewhere and also conflict and war. So, for Nehru, India's contribution or India's role in the uh, global world is not for sharing power or joining the power politics of uh, blocks, but to strengthen the uh, peace or the freedom and uh, certainly extending it to those who which, uh, those countries which are uh, colonized by the foreign, uh, foreign power and to ensure the equal opportunities of all race, uh, races without preferential treatment or hierarchical relationship in the world order. On the basis of such thoughts, therefore, when constitution was framed, Nehru wanted to incorporate within it some guidelines for India's foreign policy. And such guidelines are countries foreign policy shall be directed with a view to promoting international peace and security. The state should strive for maintaining just and honorable relation between the nation by fostering respect for international law and treaty obligation and by encouraging the settlement of international disputes by arbitration. So, these are some of the guiding principles which is enshrined in chapter 4 of Indian constitution which is about directive principle of a state policy. These provisions which also reflects India's civilizational heritage of non-aggression, striving for peace or the idea of Vasudhaiva Kutumbukam, world is uh, one family. So, uh, this philosophy or civilizational heritage is also reflective in some of these guiding principle of foreign policy which is there in the chapter 4 of Indian constitution and these guidelines by and large have shaped the foreign policy of independent India and remain a very relevant or a guiding uh, force in shaping the foreign policy in contemporary India as well. So, these provisions became the foundations or principles of many of Nehru's foreign policy initiatives and continue to guide the foreign policy of India even today. Certainly, his initiative about NAM or Panch Seal or his support for peaceful coexistence or role of um, a nation uh, or a, um, a world uh, polity to stabilize um, uh, peace or to strengthen peace or to expand the uh, freedom uh, in every part of, um, of the, uh, every part of the world or to maintain equality of all races, equal opportunities of all races which will uh, lead to everlasting peace and harmony. So, these ideals he says as we have discussed with uh, Tagore, Arvindu Ghosh to transcend the limits or the uh, 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 boundary of a nation and uh, should be guided by the collective interest of the whole humanity. So, the humanism 
the idealism in Nehru is most articulated in many of his foreign policy initiatives. Now, if you look at some of his responses to the contemporary uh, forms of internationalism, we find uh, he also uh, uh, responded to some of the initiatives such as Woodrow Wilson's and the League of Nations, which was established after the First World War to maintain global order or global peace and arbitrate the conflicts uh, through peaceful negotiation and uh, so the ideals of maintaining the uh, global peace or uh, resolving conflict through uh, peaceful negotiation is something which uh, began to be seriously articulated after the first world war and Woodrow Wilson took the initiative and his famous 14 principles Woodrow Wilson advocated peaceful coexistence among nations and he offered collective security as the means of this and took a decisive role in the formation of League of Nations. Nehru had a favorable opinion of Wilson internationalism, but he criticized League of Nations for its weak foundation as there were most countries which especially in Asia and Africa which were still colonized. So, you cannot have everlasting peace when many parts of the world are under colonial subjugation or a political subjugation of the foreign countries. So, uh, therefore, he criticized this uh, 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 League, uh, uh, League of Nations, which is founded on a very weak foundation. So, uh, again, American scholar uh, Clarence K. Strait proposed the idea of union of democracy. He stated the 15 North Atlantic nations, including US, Britain, and France, should form this union, which will deal with the matters of their common interests such as citizenship or defense. Nehru criticized this union of democracy on two grounds. Firstly, it excluded other nations such as China and India and limited itself to a few nations such as 15 North Atlantic nations. And secondly, it has included some nations which were imperialist and fascist in character, so which promote or champion democracy on the one hand and continue to subject a vast territory or a vast number of population under colonial subjugation. So, this hypocrisy in maintaining democracy or thinking about everlasting global peace or stability or common security is something unachievable in a condition where uh, the same countries uh, maintain their colony, uh, colonies or subjugate a vast number of people under their uh, rule. So, Nehru uh, was also critical of such kind of internationalism. So, Nehru held that without ruling out imperialism and colonialism, no democratic union is possible. Now, uh, to look at the features of Nehruvian internationalism, we find in his internationalism, there is a delicate or there is a kind of perfect balance between nationalism or internationalism. So, uh, uh, Nehru was uh, a nationalist. He wanted to uh, uh, to uh, strengthen India and its uh, democratic uh, uh, culture, not just to fight the uh, British, but also to transform the social economic relations within India that is hierarchical or segregated on different uh, different lines. But uh, in Nehru, there is an urge for India's role in the global uh, uh, global arena or to uh, resolve the global challenges and he was deeply uh, saddened by the lessons not learned by many western countries even after two world wars. So, that leads to again some kind of uh, uh, power uh, politics or um, kind of uh, super power uh, uh, determining or threatening the internal uh, international peace and harmony immediately after second world war in the terms of uh, Cold War between US and USSR. So, he believed that nationalism and internationalism can coexist and emphasized on maintaining a balance between the two. So, he values nationalism as it is the vital force of human society. It also has a central role in the freedom movements of colonized population. So, many people have criticized nationalism also because of its uh, selfish nature as we have seen in Rabindranath Tagore or many western thinkers also consider nationalism responsible for competition 
or competitions among the imperialist forces which resulted in first world war or second world war. So, when nationalist movement was emerging in different Asian and African countries or colonial among the colon, uh, colonized subjects, they were very suspicious of such nationalist movement, but they did not realize the liberis, uh, liberatory potential of these uh, nationalist movement against the imperial rule or against the colonial rule. So, uh, Nehru realized uh, the vital force or vital nature of nationalism for the colonized population, but he also acknowledged that it will be internationalism and not merely nationalism that will be the unifying force in the world in the future. So, even when he recognized the inevitable or the vitalness of nationalism, especially in a colonized context or in a colonized country, he also acknowledged the inevitable use or force of internationalism which will lead to unifying the world or which may work as a unifying force, force in the future. So, he also then criticized against the kind of uh, iso, uh, isolation or a kind of uh, narrowly defined nationalism of any kind. So, therefore, for the wider interest of the international community, he preferred adjustments with the national interest or in the national interest of any particular country. So, here again the larger good of humanity or human species is something which is superior to the particular interest of a nation and he wanted nations to adjust with their interest in the service of the larger interest of the humanity. So, uh, this internationalism is based on first cooperation. So, Nehru argued that no nation can sustain and develop in isolation and can afford to be indifferent to others. So, in this interdependent world which is emerging, no uh, nation can maintain its uh, sovereignty or develop itself by keeping itself aloof and isolated from the other communities or just being indifferent to the other communities. So, one is affected by the happenings in the other countries and therefore, communication and interlinkages are in inevitable. So, the honorable relation with other nation is something which is inevitable for the existence or also for the development and progress of any particular countries. So, the role of cooperation is something which he emphasized. So, he advocates cooperation as the only means to survival and progress for any country. As with cooperation, the states in crisis can receive help from the others. Absence of it will lead to mutual conflict and disruption of peace. But this cooperation should be based on equality. This is also something which he emphasized and also the mutual welfare. So, developed nations should pull up the underdeveloped ones to their equal levels of advancement. So, the world of uh, his era was divided into different blocks and the newly emerging uh, Asian and African countries were regarded or categorized as a third world country. So, first world is US and its allies, second world is uh, USSR and its allies and these newly emerged countries which uh, on the initiative of uh, Nehru and uh, some other leaders like Tito, Nasser and Sukarno, they uh, uh, started non-alignment movement. So, these movement were to ensure uh, the sovereignty of uh, newly emerging nation and to develop some kind of collective security for these emerging nations in a world which is divided into two, uh, two superpower and to strive for equal status and mutual welfare is something which he also emphasized through cooperation. The second emphasis is opposition to the war and focus on peace or negotiation as a useful means for diplomatic negotiation. So, he viewed war as the negation of truth and humanity. It does not only lead to further violence, but also shackles the morality of the parties involved. So, he advocated the elimination of war as an instrument of foreign policy, because war cannot lead to peace and prosperity, but can only create the environment of mutual hatred and fear, which is dangerous for any country or certainly for global peace and harmony. So, by the elimination of war cannot be possible only with the elimination of its symptoms. It demands the elimination of the roots of war and for him the root causes of war and conflict is the political subjugation of one nation over the other 
racial discrimination or absence of equality and economic relations and misery. So, the global conflicts and war has root causes in these political subjugations, racial discrimination and absence of economic equality or uh, equality in economic relations between different, uh, different countries and the misery. So, he uh, along with many emerging Asian and African countries were also demanding a kind of um, new economic relations which will uh, which will uplift these uh, economically underdeveloped or undeve undeveloped nation at par with the developed nation of the uh, uh, developed nation of the west so there is also demand for the uh, uh, new economic relations um, uh, and through that one can eliminate the causes of the war and not merely the symptoms. The other part of his international is the support for disarmament. So, Nehru was against all weapons of destruction or certainly nuclear uh, bombs and he denounced the claim that these can be used as deterrents. So, many people justify the use of nuclear bomb as a deterrent which can protect a nation from the aggression from the other nation. But Nehru did not accept this kind of weapons as a deterrent in foreign policy and he stated that no peace can be built on the pillars of fear. So, again the idealism or the morality in Nehru enabled him to see the emerging world in a very different way than perhaps a pragmatic or a realist thinker or a leader will look at it. So, he regarded disarmament of these weapons as the first step towards the elimination of war. So, he continuously argued for the disarmament of certainly all kinds of weapons and most importantly the weapons of mass destruction such as nuclear bomb and all. So, he wrote disarmament is not merely a desirable alternative to the present competitive arming, where every country is racing for more and more weapons and acquiring more and more power of mass destruction. So, for he wrote that disarmament is not merely a desirable alternative to this present competitive arming, it is an imperative if we are to survive. So, in this context he stress on the role of uh, UN and United Nations continuously strives towards this disarmament policy which we have seen every now and then between US and USSR the uh, talks about disarmament and also Nehru believed in the role of disarmament as a tool for sustaining economic or uh, s uh, sustaining uh, order and peace in the uh, global uh, arena. However, although Nehru was for nuclear disarmament, he was not against the uses of nuclear energy for peaceful objectives. So, the energy needs of the third world countries, especially Asian and African underdeveloping countries, he recognized the role of nuclear energy for this peaceful objectives. So, he stated that the atomic energy for the underdeveloped nations are far more essential than that of developed nations because developed nations may have enough resources for alternative energy, but the underdeveloped nations do not have such resources or the capabilities. So, the, he emphasized upon the need of nuclear energy for the underdeveloped countries. So, any restrictions in their uses of atomic energy therefore, can put them in disadvantageous positions and therefore, he argued against prohibition of atomic energy uh, and its use by the underdeveloped countries. Now, he also had an idea of world government and Nehru envisioned a post nation state world order. It be realized in the system of a world union based on democracy and freedom. In this world union, nations will enjoy autonomy in their internal matters and have equal representation at the global level. It will be against all forms of domination such as imperialism, colonialism and racism and based on cooperation and coexistence on equal grounds. It will be the perfect order of humanity. This in the idea of world union, Nehru's idealism, humanism and internationalism finds a complete and holistic expression. However, in actual unfolding of the world situations, especially after India-China war of 1962, had put a serious questions mark on Nehruvian model of internationalism and it also lead to critique of Nehruvian foreign policy. Now, if you look at Nehru's internationalism and India's foreign policy, Nehru was the first prime minister and so the foreign minister of independent India for 17 years. 
he had a defining influence in shaping the foreign policy of independent India. So, he has a particular view on nation or internationalism and that shapes the uh, characteristic or nature of foreign policy in independent India. And this is reflected in the foreign policy that we have in at least 2-3 decades after the independence. But the foreign policy of a country is not formulated or shaped in a single day or by one individual and it has a deeper roots in the spiritual and the cultural uh, inheritance of India and therefore, it also represents her history and civilization. Nehruvian foreign policy was also influenced by the dynamism of the Indian struggle for freedom and different articulation that was being carried out by different thinkers such as Ghosh, Rabindranath Tagore certainly and their thought has influence on Nehru as well and he shared some of his, uh, uh, his concerns when he was uh, articulating uh, about India's role in the emerging global order. So, many of uh, the ideas such as a striving for peace or resolving conflicts through peaceful, uh, uh, peaceful dialogue or negotiation is something which cannot be reduced to one individual. It has certain cultural or civilizational inheritance and in India, the foreign policy which is adopted is rooted in such civilizational belief about, um, uh, about role of dialogue and um, uh, role of peace or uh, how nations should strive for peace and harmony or that how that can lead to uh, uh, prosperity. So, uh, uh, India's foreign policy to a great extent uh, subscribed or shaped by such civilizational and cultural beliefs as well. Nehru gave it a definite shape and actually acted upon uh, such, uh, such beliefs or um, uh, philosophy when he uh, became the prime minister and also the foreign minister of the independent India. So, uh, flourished in the rich heritage of Indian culture and heritage, Indian foreign policy was also tempered by the changing realities of the world. So, the historical events of Cold War, the attempts of the superpowers to drag newly independent nations to one or the another military camps had forced India to tread a very cautious, but tactical and pragmatic path in order to maintain its sovereignty in the foreign policy. So, the condition of the world was such where superpowers were trying to uh, drag newly emerging nations in Asia and Africa in one or the other uh, other blocks. Nehru and uh, 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 through his uh, understanding, many Asian and African countries together develop a, uh, uh, a movement or an uh, organization which enable them to engage with the um, uh, realities of uh, that world in a very cautious and uh, careful uh, uh, pragmatic manner to protect their sovereignty and also collectively negotiate for their uh, uh, development or progress. So, though Nehru was an internationalist in the truest sense of the term, he did not ignore the regional dynamics of the world politics. On the need of the cooperation between South Asian nations and India, he stated that we are of Asia and the people of Asia are nearer and closer to us than others. India is so situated that she is the pivot of Western, Southern and South East Asia and the future is born to see a closer union between India and South East Asia on the one side and Afghanistan, Iran and Arab world on the other. So, Nehru was also very realist and pragmatic in that sense to acknowledge the emerging dynamics or the regional dynamics or what we call geopolitics of the foreign policy or the international relation. So, further on Nehru signed the Pansil agreement with China in 1954 which led this five principle which becomes the guiding force for the foreign policy of many countries especially in Asian and African countries. These five principle which is named as Panch Seal is peaceful coexistence respecting each other's sovereignty and territorial integrity, first this is second, then non-aggression, third, non-interference in each other's internal matters that is fourth and recognition of equality and mutual benefit, working for the mutual benefit and prosperity that is the fifth. So, these are the five principle or punch seal, five principles on the basis of which 
many foreign policy objectives or methods uh, were formulated. And although second by the Chinese aggression of 1962, this punch still continued till today as the guiding principle of Indian foreign policy and it had influenced the foreign policy of many Asian and African countries as well. So, in the context of Cold War, the other initiatives Nehru had was that he became one of the major proponents of non-alignment movement along with Tito, Nasser and Sukarno and others which stressed on not aligning with any of the superpower. So, that is the idea of non-alignment movement. It did not mean neutrality or neither it was a maintenance of equidistance from the two power blocks. It has some idealistic uh, basis or moral basis to uh, maintain a distance from uh, the power politics that was uh, unfolding in the uh, contemporary world and yet engaging with that world in a principled manner on the basis of certain principles and not merely uh, guided by the power politics or maximization of self interest of a particular nation or a group. So, non-alignment movement for uh, Nehru is not absolute neutrality or withdrawal from the world uh, uh, from the real world, but to engage with uh, the real world in a principled manner maintaining one's sovereignty and independence in decision making. So, it was an attempt of building an independent path of development. It was the only path through which the third world countries, the newly emerging countries in Asia and Africa could maintain a safer distance from the superpowers and protect their sovereignty and independence from any external interference or compromising on their sovereignty uh, in terms of uh, making decisions about the foreign policies or their internal matters. Now, it focused on extending world peace and freedom and reducing the impact of cold war politics, the rivalry, imminent uh, danger of such rivalry between two superpowers. So, taking initiation in the independence of colonized nation, it also stressed on bringing of a just economic order on the basis of equality and cooperation. So, non-alignment movement that Nehru initiated is not just about tackling the political realities of the world, but to um, also collectively negotiate for a new economic world, uh, world or world order as well. Because even when these nations got the political independence, economically they were dependent on their former uh, col uh, colonizer. So, that uh, um, new colonialism which we call they were also trying to fight against this new forms of colonialism in terms of economic uh, relationship and they wanted to make uh, such uh, relations uh, more just, more equitable uh, for these, uh, these countries. So, um, now if you look at the uh, conclusion uh, uh, and uh, to have some concluding remarks on Nehru's thought on internationalism, but generally also his um, overall uh, contribution and also his failures, uh, one can certainly uh, say it for sure that he has greatest influence on um, the uh, first two, three decades of India, uh, Indian uh, free India or independent India. He helped in shaping many institutions uh, and um, which includes IITs, IIMs or many academies for uh, literature or for uh, the development of culture. So, uh, or some uh, institution like election commission of India, which played a pivotal role in the uh, shaping of democratic culture or uh, parliamentary democracy in India. So, uh, uh, despite of the challenges that India faced after the partition or economic or uh, other challenges, uh, it uh, uh, went ahead with a uh, with uh, with a parliamentary form of democracy, which is nothing sort of a miracle. Or when many uh, Western scholars were arguing about that India will eventually uh, uh, disintegrate and uh, there will be fragmentation. India had maintained by and large uh, um, its boundary fairly well 
and also continued to the path of democracy and uh, elections after elections, our faith in the democracy has further strengthened. So, one form of government, one form of parties replaced by other form, uh, other, uh, other parties and the peaceful transfer of power is something which we have achieved and which we should be proud of despite of so many challenges that we have faced. So, in the words of S. Gopal, Nehru consolidated a nation. So, first the consolidation of this fragmentary or segregated nation or heterogeneous nation into a one single unit. So, Nehru consolidated a nation, trained it for democracy and constructed a model of economic development and set the country on the path of growth. So, that is the contribution Nehru made in the uh, journey of post independent India. And as a political leader and intellectual, he had a much broader understanding of national as well as the international happenings. So, this reflects in his periodic letters to the chief ministers and could influence the progressive force in India and abroad. However, there are certain valid criticism against Nehru such as his over emphasis on ethics and morality and ignoring the pragmatic concern of national self interest. So, foreign policy is about realistically speaking pursuit and maximization of national interest, but if one is guided by morality and ethics alone then there are compromise with the national interest or the possibility of harming the national interest. So, his other initiatives such as non-alignment movement and pencil did not really uh, lead to desired objective or ideals. Certainly, the Indian China war and also the intra groupings within the Asian and African countries or so called non-alignment countries are also reflective of such uh, uh, tensions. Within the, uh, within the group who otherwise share or share a same history or share the same concerns and fight for the new, uh, new, economic, uh, new, new economic order. So, the uh, reality or realism of uh, the world something which shows the uh, in a practical uh, sense the limitation of Nehruvian ideals as well. On domestic uh, front too, we can also find that we he could have uh, handled some of the issues uh, perhaps more cautiously or in a uh, better way such as Kashmir issue or language agitations, communist part in Kerala or the bureaucracy that he built which turned out to be a, a self perpetuating license quotas and it actually becomes the obstruction in India's uh, growth trajectory or India's progress. So, Nehru fairly share some of the criticism as well. However, he had a vision of modern India which is situated in the context of world community and he admired the greatness of entity called India, but was aware of the danger of cultural and national development in isolation. Therefore, he emphasized on revising the old and initiating new ties with the rest of the world as a matter of utmost importance and which in which he has succeeded and established. India's role or India's contribution in maintaining global order or peace and harmony. So, certainly in Korea war he sent Indian peacekeeping force or in many uh, international initiatives he established the role, uh, uh, role of India as a major power. So, as an advocate of national well being and international harmony he will always be regarded as a true internationalist and humanist. So, this tribute to Nehru by Tito the former president of Yugoslavia wrote that India can be proud having such an outstanding leader as Nehru who through his efforts and farsightedness is paving the way towards a better future for India and who through his untiring activity in the struggle for peace, devotion to the policy of coexistence and the strengthening of peaceful international cooperation has become one of the most outstanding statesmen of the world. So, Nehru and his ideals were not limited and applicable and relevant to India and its context alone, but he was truly a uh, international statesman and he was regarded. So, by many of the world lead, uh, leaders including Tito or many, um, many other um, uh, global leaders as well. So, in Nehru we find him a great institution builder, a nationalist, liberal, socialist, secular democrat and rightly therefore, he is regarded as the architect of modern India. 
his ideals and opinions even after his death and many of his failures will remain as relevant and perhaps more relevant today than it was during his time. So, that is the legacy of Nehru. So, there are many things which is under challenge or under uh, critique, but um, the uh, path that we have followed uh, despite of the challenges that we have faced is something which uh, we must uh, attribute to the Nehru and his, uh, his ideals and that remains a kind of um, uh, guiding uh, force or a guiding principle for contemporary India as, as well. Certainly, his views on secularism, parliament, uh, parliament or parliamentary form of democracy, the role of institutions, uh, the uh, uh, expansion of uh, democratic culture and um, uh, uh, eradication or elimination of hierarchy within a community or across the community is something which we need to seriously uh, engage with. So, um, by that we conclude this um, uh, lecture on um, Nehru and his views on internationalism and on this you can look at some of these texts like Discovery of India by Nehru and also Nehru by Benjamin Jakaria which is a very good biography. Sources of Indian tradition you can find some original speeches and writings of Nehru and from political thought in modern India by uh, Pentham and Kenneth Duch you can find a chapter on Nehru which is also very helpful to understand many of his ideals on democracy, socialism, secularism, scientific temper or internationalism and all. And also V R Mehta foundation of Indian political thought and a lecture by T N Call on Nehru the idealist and the revolutionary and also Nehruvian internationalism principles features and relevance by Sunil Kumar in Pakistan horizon. So, these are some of the texts which you can refer to to understand uh, Nehru and Nehruvian uh, uh, views on internationalism. Thanks for listening. Thank you all.